and welcome to Fathoms Deep, a Black Sales podcast from Common Room Radio. I'm Liz Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. How are you doing? Shit, Daphne? Liz. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, a big one. Wow. This wow. Felt so much like a finale. It's hard to, it's hard to <laughs> reconcile myself with the fact that this is mid-season. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. Wow. Right. I know crazy shit happened. I mean, I'm I, glad it's not yeah. the finale because right? I want other crazy shit to happen, but yep. Sure, sure. I know. Okay, well, I think we need to start. Wait, I need to pour myself a glass. You do. You need some liquor to get through this episode, I think. Yes. I do, absolutely. I have a lovely Manhattan just now. They're becoming my new drink of choice. And I'm drinking rum. How appropriate. Good for you, a proper pirate. I am a proper pirate today. All right. Now that I have something in my glass, mm-hmm. let's raise a glass to Eleanor. Eleanor, you arced beautifully. You had become, didn't I just say last episode, yep. she was becoming my favorite character? You God did. God damn it. I- <laughs> and didn't we have a theory running? Was it our theory or was it Alistair's theory? That like, uh, asked- No, it's Alistair's theory. That, that Alistair when Stevens people, has a theory. Yeah, mm-hmm. that when people make their duality whole, that is yes. when they die die and meet their end <laughs> ah damn it I yeah hate it when he's right yeah uh yeah i mean yes and no this was a beautiful death it was this is heartbreaking death. and this was a beautiful death and you know all the theorizing about how i mean in the fandom with our guests I, I don't know if you and i ever like had any theories about how eleanor was would die i thought eleanor would survive the season I thought she'd survive the series. See, I thought she would die, and I thought that it would be... I mean, it's funny, because we're about to talk a whole lot more, like, a whole lot more about vengeance in this episode, and I was sure that she was going to die at someone's hands, someone we know. Yes. Um, Someone who has had a reason to kill her, and that's not what happened. And, yeah, we'll talk about that, but I just... ah, It was just... It was... The perfect death in so many ways, and I'm beautiful. I'm very sad. <laughs> <laughs> it was very moving and touching. Yeah, yes. yeah, it was. All right. Um, before we get into this episode, I have a few fun details. First of all, we had a lovely, totally impromptu game based on your joke about Billy not being yes. a cinnamon roll. So, if mm. anyone wants to go still look at this, though, <laughs> still scrumptious. <laughs> well, not exactly in this episode, but you know. In general, Ah. yes. So if anyone would like to check that out, uh, the hashtag on Twitter is BBPastry. And we had had people... I'm so proud. (laughs) And a lot of people participated. And we asked them to say, if he's not a sweet cinnamon roll anymore, what pastry is he and why? And Uh the entries were hilarious and wonderful. Mm-hmm. And uh, we did do this one for a drawing for a prize, and I think we can say who's going to be the person doing the drawing for us. Yes, no? we can. The person we're interviewing tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Who do we have a date with, Daphne? Uh, we have a date with Tom Hopper tomorrow. So uh, yes, we do tomorrow our time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tomorrow podcasting time. Right, yes. tomorrow podcasting time. Um, so yes, he is going to do the drawing for us, and uh, you know. What a sweetheart. He is a cinnamon yes. roll. What a sweetheart. <laughs> and a good sport, I must say. A good sport, Tom Hopper. Indeed. I cannot wait to flirt with you tomorrow. It's going to be so fun. That's so, yeah. So stay tuned. So it is going to be a few more days before the person who won the drawing because Tom's going to choose that person. Right. And then, yeah. And then it'll take us a few more days to edit. So we will announce yes. as soon as we can mm-hmm. who won the drawing. Uh, and gets a prize. And uh, other fun things is we had a lot of emails this week. And oh my gosh, so many. And really so great many. ones. Really fabulous ones. Thank you everyone for emailing us. It's always so much fun for us. Everyone has such great ideas and mm. it's just really fun for us. I just wanted to quote one. Don't have time to quote all of them because it's a big episode. But yeah. there was one and there that, were a lot of emails. <laughs> right. There were a lot of emails. And they're great. The one I wanted to quote is uh, Laura, who is at Old Long John. 
she had many amazing points, but the one point that really uh, kind of took me in a new direction that I thought is actually very relevant to here is that we've compared Woods Rogers' choice to go to Havana to Jack, to like something Jack would do, that kind of gambling. Oh, yes. Uh Uh-huh. We sure did. And she compared it to Miranda's idea to go to Charlestown. Oh, interesting. To okay. take a chance. And so what kind of in a conversation she and I had about that, I came up with this is like the mechanics of it. True. Totally true. Like this is mm-hmm. what Miranda did was basically let's go to a scary place that might want to do us ill so right. that we could gamble and possibly do something. But there's one main difference. And I think that that's very relevant to to the difference between season two and this season, perhaps, mm-hmm. or or just in general. The difference is that when Miranda and Flint went to Charlestown, it was a moment of them setting aside their revenge. Like revenge. Oh, ah, uh, yes. Revenge, yes. you know, revenge has been an important part of this show from the beginning. Yes. Mostly Flint, also Miranda. Mm-hmm. Um in this season, I feel like, you know, I know I keep saying that word over and over again. Revenge is huge in this season. Right. And yes. and as a motivator, the difference is that Woods Rogers, so they were going to set aside their revenge mm-hmm. instincts or approach and try to, for reconciliation. Woods Rogers went to Havana for the purpose of his revenge and then mm. used revenge as a way to convince the Spanish Yes. governor to join him uh-huh. so that so it's interesting and it, like in all things with black sales when things are similar i feel like the th- the two things that are similar what becomes most interesting is the place where they diverge from each other and that's sure. the big divergence and so that's a really especially because flint and woods rogers in season three we had such clear lines drawn of them right. being parallels or, you know, parallels, dis- yes. you know, parallels in different Excellent. times. Right. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. So I just find that really interesting. We know, you know, we know how the Charlestown story turned out. We now know mm-hmm. part of how the Havana story has played out, although yes. I believe not all of it. I mean, I think we're just no, at the beginning. No, of course right. not. Yeah, we're still in the thick of things very much. Right. So it is interesting. And both Rogers and... Flint lost their partners. Yes. And yet still, we'll see how this works out for Rogers. I think mm-hmm. Flint lost his partner, but came out himself in a horrifying way stronger than ever. I'm not sure that's going to be the case for uh, Rogers. Yeah. Which would yeah. fit very well with season four, that it seems like anyone motivated by revenge ends up hurting themselves right. more than anyone else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Okay. And the last thing, I'll do this quickly. I'm just going to bring this up and everyone can go look it up. Scorpion 80, who is what's Scorpion? Scorpion Pierce. Scorpion Pierce. Thank you. Scorpion Uh Pierce. I actually know people's pirate names better than I know. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Scorpion Pierce brought up um, with the name Julius. uh, Yes. Had looked up references to, to, um, to, formerly enslaved people who were pirates with wow. the name and found two Caesars. There are in fact two char- two historical characters who who could one of them is an actual pirate from the 1700s who's called yeah. Black Caesar that you can look up on Wikipedia who seemed quite vicious and also was part of Blackbeard's crew. Oh wow. Okay. And then there's another one in the 1800s who's Henry Caesar, Henri Caesar, because he's because he's Haitian, so I'm assuming. Oh, sure, okay. Who was part of the Haitian Revolution? Wow, okay. So, like a really good parallel to this Julius, who's Very not Julius cool. Caesar, but I don't know. No. I but who no I really idea. like Great again, new character. Right. Have no idea if any of this was intentional on the part of the writers, but it's just a kind. If not, it's just a really fun coincidence and yes. worth looking those two guys up on Wikipedia. So Very everyone cool. go do that. Okay. All right, so now I'm ready to start talking about this episode. Sail! The groupings that I have are basically Eleanor Maddie with Flint, mm-hmm. Silver with Flint, I mean by himself and then with Flint, and then Janix. 
That's right. We get Janix this episode. Yeah. Return of Janix. So, I like it. Right. For new listeners who haven't gone back, who are listening in season four and haven't listened to our older episodes, Janix is a impromptu name that Liz gave for Jack, Ann, and Max back yes. when they were kind of a celebrity threesome of a sort. Right. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, so that is that is uh if you if you do go back and listen to season two, you'll get to hear all about Gen X. And for people who people who've been with us all along, Gen X is back, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought at the end we'll talk about Woods Rogers in Spain and kind of go go into a discussion of like sure. what what does this all mean mm -hmm. for everyone. Okay. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah, uh let's start. All right, let's get into it. Prepare to board. Hi. So, uh, Liz, before we start with characters, did you want to just like freak out a little bit about the ships? Because they're not really part of the characters. Because they're beautiful. Yeah, but you know what? My favorite scene actually was when we saw the walrus in the background when Jack was on the beach. Uh huh. It was beautiful. It Gorgeous. Was, wasn't it that beautiful? Was it was like coming over moment. the side. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, coming around the corner, kind of ghostly and ethereal and mm -hmm. just frigging gorgeous. And I'm always so impressed with how everybody can name the ships from that distance. They're like, oh, it's right. Morris. I know, and it was how Max. How do you even know Max? How do you right. know? I know? Exactly. I thought the same thing. I was like, really? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Sure, I don't really care. Not? It was lovely. and It was. and Right. And Max, oh, right. I didn't read. A, I have a Max quote that I wanted to read before we start anything. I mean, other oh, okay. than freaking out about ships. I was going to say, well, now's your moment. So this is a Max quote from episode three of season four. And I feel like if this line was in this episode, it would be my thesis statement. Since it's not from this episode, it can't oh. be our thesis statement. But I feel like it sets the tone very beautifully. Now, Max was talking about Behringer here to Eleanor, although... I went back and looked at it, and it almost could have been like she's talking about Woods Rogers as well. Like it's interesting. It, okay. I mean, I don't. I think she was really talking about Berenger, but I think this relates to a lot of people's experience in this episode. She said, "You think you can control him? Yes. And by the time you realize he's been controlling you, it is going to be too late." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just feel like this sets the mood for this and right sure particularly woods rogers in spain okay woods rogers in mm -hmm. spain right so i just feel like yeah, yeah. this really relates to what's Oof. going on with a lot of people in this episode mm -hmm. okay okay and, that's good and also since we're well we're not starting with max but can i just further say before we get into the other characters like mm -hmm. i think the title of this episode should be like everyone just listened to max already seriously oh well it looks like they're gonna finally yeah well, you're getting your wish it looks like jack will at least i don't jack, know yeah. uh, but oh, you know jack. i just like i just like max is just pissed off this whole episode and she's right yes. she has every right to be just pissed off this of course episode. she does yeah because nobody ever listened to her and look what a mess we're all in <laughs> indeed <laughs> all right but yes uh okay let's talk about eleanor and maddie Oh, we're going to start right there, huh? Okay. Well, we're going to start on the beach with them. But yes, we are going We are going to start with Eleanor and Maddie. I just... Sure. Um, yeah, it just seemed right to start with them. I just... I'm so moved by these scenes with them together. And, you know, I made such a big deal last episode of just them facing each other. That's and... right. And you said you wanted a conversation between the two of them. <laughs> well... You got it. Well, and I'm starting to think that if I say I want a conversation between characters, it means one of them will die. Like, uh -oh. how, yep. how many Whoops. times did I talk about wanting Jack and Teach to talk to each other? That's true. Uh -oh. I need to just yeah. stop saying this. I'm just like, I'm doom <laughs> I, am, I am the doom of characters. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. Well, where so, did you want to start with their conversation? I, ha I only had one note about it, and one, and it's really a question. Do you want to start with your question? Uh, well, well, sure. I just wonder about Maddie's response to Eleanor when she says, mm -hmm. "My father mistrusted all of you." Mm -hmm. What her motivation for that was? What What is she doing? Is what I wrote down. Right. Why Why is she taking this tack with Eleanor? Well, this is my question for all of the conversations. So that's a really good, like, that's okay. the perfect question. So I think what we should yeah. do is we'll, I'll take us through the conversations. Okay. And we can gauge really what 
what's Maddie doing? It's true. Uh-huh. It's it's not a hundred percent clear, and and I think it's very likely a mix of things. Yes. So. Okay, so Eleanor starts, and I think Eleanor was trying to get the upper hand when she, you know, when mm-hmm. she said, you know, you trust Flint, but your father mistrusted him, and that's when Maddie tells the story, and and I love that Maddie's talking about them, and you're watching Eleanor. Yes, and her response, yeah, which is lovely. Hannah knew is lovely in this entire episode. She's grown so much in this character. Yeah, I remember uh, in early episodes saying that I felt that Hannah New's performance was uh, my least favorite of all of the ensemble cast, but she's been beautiful. I mean, just so such subtle beautiful and subtlety. Yes, yep. uh huh. Such beautiful subtlety, and yeah, and this, and it, it's interesting because this this scene in particular, I think we got to see her grasp of Eleanor at different phases in Eleanor. So, okay. So, oh, sure. Uh-huh. So, we, so we have, so Maddie says, um, you were my sister. Yes. And then she says, ah, this, I, I, you this were beautiful me. and I revered right. you. Oh, yes. And then she explains to her, she said, I, I'm sure that when you heard my mother and I were dead, it affected it you. It must have affected you. Right. And my father, all of those years, my father could have lessened your pain by telling you, by divulging that we were still alive. Mm-hmm. And he didn't. And that's how she explains to Eleanor that it's not just Flint, that Scott mistrusted all of them. Mm-hmm. And you watch, yeah, Hannah's face. I mean, again, Eleanor tries, she tried to get the upper hand by, mm-hmm. by bringing up Scott and it just turned against her and you know this is it's such a perfect introduction to their conversations because Eleanor she thinks she's good at this stuff and she sometimes is okay at it but Maddie is masterful at it yes Mm -hmm. which is not to say I mean I think Maddie's also speaking from her heart like when you ask what she's doing I mean she is she turned Eleanor's question against her and definitely when they look at each other, Maddie gives her, I mean, it's just, you know, Eleanor is now hurt and Maddie is regal. Mm-hmm. Maddie is so regal. Gosh, I keep thinking that every time she's on screen. But I think she's also sincere. I mean, I think, you know, I always think back to that moment when they came in season three, when Maddie came to Nassau with Silver, when Silver killed Dufresne. Uh-huh. And she's in that courtyard and she's talking to Emmy and she's, she says, you know, that moment where she says, we were friends, we were playmates. I don't think that Maddie is without emotion about all of this and not just because she didn't have her father all those years. I mean, this is, this is part of her childhood as well. Yeah. Like they were, they were sisters. I I do believe that. I mean, of course, with inequality of one of them being enslaved and the other one's Mm -hmm. family, but that doesn't mean when they were small children that they didn't grow up that way that they didn't grow up as as sisters as sisters to some extent i mean as playmates Uh as you know children sure children don't necessarily understand what's going on in those situations Mm -hmm. so it's hard for you to imagine that maddie also doesn't have you know that what she said about eleanor i'm sure that she does um I, i suppose what what i'm so she was turning the the table on Eleanor. Is that what you're saying? Like Eleanor was trying to uh, what to say something hurtful to Maddie about? Well, she was trying to get between Maddie and Flint. She was trying to sow seeds of sure. distrust. Uh huh. And again, she hadn't seen Maddie and Flint together, and she doesn't clearly doesn't know Maddie. I mean, she just found out right. Right. that day that Maddie still, or the day before, however the timeline worked in the in the cell in the fort, she had just found out that Maddie's still alive, even. Mm-hmm. But. Yeah, I mean, I think Eleanor was trying to put a wedge in there, and and Maddie turned that around on Eleanor by. Mm-hmm. I, she, it's hard for me to imagine that Maddie didn't understand, knowing what she knew about about Scott's situation, and she even yeah. asked him. She you know she asked him. She said to him, "Like this must be hard for you, your two daughters." Remember? Right. Yes. Yes. When he said only. So you. Uh-huh. right, exactly. When he said only you, but. Eleanor at that point didn't know that. And so mm-hmm. Maddie understands, I'm sure, the amount of emotion that she could invoke 
let's say mm-hmm. i'm not going to say i'm not going to call okay, it manipulation sure. exactly but i think you know it was a it was a deflection i don't think she was actively trying to do sure. something bad to eleanor but she was deflecting, deflecting i like okay right? a deflection does that make sure. sense that makes much more sense to me now i'm following a little more right yeah. that's that's okay. what i see this it's deliberate it's uh-huh. not without emotion on maddie's side i mean this is my interpretation no and i don't think it was without yeah i, I mean i think that the emotion was clear uh, uh, yeah it's to, to me it was just the motivation, like what her end game was in phrasing it in such a way to Eleanor, mm-hmm. that's what made me curious. I think, it wasn't yeah, that I, I think... doubted her sincerity. I certainly didn't. Just that I wondered why she said it in in such a way. Um, right, because yeah, she could have said a lot of things. She could have said, "Ding, Eleanor," with saying that Scott mistrusted her all of those years that to undermine her relationship with Scott. Right. I mean, I think. I think it was, I think it probably had more to do with Maddie than anything else. Like she's asserting, you know, and she is, remember, she does think of herself as the younger sibling here also. Like she's also a princess. She's also a leader of people. She's also a younger Mm -hmm. sibling. I think there's some aspect where she's just, she's saying, all right, former older sister who's trying to get under my skin, like, it's not going to be that easy. Like, understand where I come from. I come from a perspective Mm -hmm. where where we are we and you are part of they. Yes, and uh-huh, that's sure. what my father actually taught me. Ah, uh, uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, like right. I don't think it was supposed to be, I mean, again, these are some hurtful words because she is saying, you know, basically my, fa- <laughs> sorry, I'm going to be like Max, like <laughs> my father, like the, the way Max right, sure, saw the father sure. thing, like <laughs> our our bizarrely combined father, who wasn't really our combined father, mm-hmm. actually didn't trust you. There is that element in there. Like right. he could have relieved your pain. This person who you thought was taking care of you all this time mm-hmm. actually wasn't. So it's not again. Right. Actually, there are, me. Uh-huh. there are barbs here, but I feel like it. I feel like it's more about deflection. But at the same time, the the part that's most important is that it is calculated. Mm-hmm. Sure. And and it, what I really love about this, I mean, aside from, you know, Maddie being amazing and so fascinating always, is that Eleanor, you watch her become more and more vulnerable in her face. Mm-hmm. And at the end of it, she kind of snaps herself out of it. And then she becomes that hard Eleanor, like her response yes. to this emotional Definitely. Right. And so I just feel like to shut down. Mm -hmm. Right. And she gets kind of that kind of barking orders version. And I and I I felt like this moment explained all of Eleanor. Like, that's it. Everything we've ever said about Eleanor was 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 shown in this moment that all of Eleanor's flailing and her and her hard exterior and the stuff that Mm -hmm. a lot of people don't like about her has always been a response to being hurt Mm, interesting like this was this was like we had a momentary beautiful demonstration of that is that Mm -hmm. she's so hurt and her way to deal with that is to just like put on that you know eleanor mask right and then go and bark orders at people and give looks to jack i mean i was like i was kind of sad because i was like okay jack's only ever seen that eleanor and kind of hates her well totally Mm -hmm. hates her and i was just like and but when she walked up to jack she's that eleanor again yes (laughs) i Mm -hmm. mean it doesn't really matter jack's gonna hate her no matter what she killed bane yes true but but it, it occurred to me in one of my watches where i was like oh I wish Jack could see like that other Eleanor for a second, but it wouldn't have mattered. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah. So I just thought, yeah, it's that was a beautiful opening to then the scenes we have afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then we have the walking towards uh, wherever they were. I guess they were walking. Oh, right. They were walking back to the fort. And and we have the conversation between Eleanor and Flint, which, again, it was it was really. I don't know. The Flint and Eleanor here is fascinating to me. Again, we have this soft Flint. We ha- I don't know what to make of him still all the time. You know, I actually have a note later. Well, yeah, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about soft- the softness of Flint. Ta- we'll talk, yeah, about-, we'll talk okay. about it. We'll get there. Okay. Because, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because he is, you know, making an argument or leaving mm-hmm. an opening for her to join them again with his, you know, what does he say? Once you saw what I saw, which I feel like, you know, that's part of this whole thing about paths, 
that Billy said, you know, you're going down a path that no one can see but you. Right. Mm -hmm. And then Silver talking about Maddie and Flint going down the same path. Like he's mm -hmm. he's he's leaving this opening to Eleanor. Like you you were one of my path people once upon a time. Right, right. Yeah. Since you were a pirate once. Right? And you were a pirate yeah, once. Yeah, right. which is very interesting. I know. I love this. And he said, Stranger things have happened. Truer mm -hmm. words. <laughs> <laughs> strange things have happened all over the place but yeah i love that i mean he really he was very soft about it though he's just like he's like hey we were we were we were going down the same road once upon a time like right. maybe maybe you want to go down that road with me and he wasn't saying it in a threatening way or no. it was just i don't know it was really lovely and then they run into the spanish soldiers and then where does flint take them Miranda's house, of course. Yes. yes. Oh. <laughs> yes. Uh, so now we have a new version of people being in Miranda's house, which is really interesting. Like, first of all, Flint just took redcoats to Miranda's house. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And this, I love Flint with the redcoats because they are so obviously falling in line to him through the whole thing. <laughs> Like, they are soldiers, and he is a general, and that is yep. just the way it works. Or a captain, of course. But he's such a leader among men. I know. And you can see how people just, they can't help themselves. They fall in line. Yep. It's I know. gorgeous. Yeah. And well, and he was so smart about it all. I mean, of course. Okay, first. Oh, of course you know, he was. Yes. Once they, yeah, right. Once about it. Exactly. But yeah, I love that moment when when they're when they are going to the wall and waiting for the Spanish soldiers, and yeah, the one guy says, cocks wait. his rifle. Yes. 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 And, and then was, they're all like, okay, this is the man with the strategy. We will listen yep. to him now. And it's mm -hmm. great. It's really great. It is. Yeah. It's gorgeous. <sighs> right. So they're at Miranda's house and, and Eleanor is like, I don't understand. Why Spain? And Flint's like, let me tell you exactly why, even though I didn't see any of this happen, but I just mm -hmm. get, I just understand how people work. Exactly. <laughs> well, and particularly... And particularly, I think, Woods Rogers. I mean, after he sure. had that conversation with Woods Rogers on the beach, I think he got a real good read on who he is. Yeah. Yep. And we know that Flint, yeah, he gets people. He does. Absolutely. But he was very gentle with her, too, here, when she said, that's not what happened. That is not what happened. Right. And he says, well, it doesn't matter how it happened. Let's so, just deal with it. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But, oh, and Eleanor needs so much to believe in Woods Rogers, especially after that last conversation she had with Flint, mm -hmm. when he says, are you right. sure that he's not just like the rest of us? Right. She just needs to believe in him. And she needs to believe in her husband, which I psh, understand, honey. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but humans are flawed. And, Aren't uh, we just? Yep, mm -hmm. that's for sure. And, uh, you know. And misguided. I don't know. Yes. I'm, I guess. I guess I'm feeling a tiny bit more generous toward. Nah, not really. Uh, not, not feeling at all generous towards Woods Rogers. Oh, really? <laughs> this this episode did a lot to give to humanize him for me again. I'm sure. Okay. I might. I might. I might do my best to like. Yeah. Sorry. Didn't work for me. He cares about Eleanor, but he. You know, every other aspect of what he does is just horrific. Well, sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Okay. okay, we're not at we're not at that part yet. We will all discuss right, Woods right. Rogers, and I, it's okay. going to be an interesting conversation. I can tell already. Mm -hmm. All right, so now uh, we're still in Eleanor and Maddie. So now we're at the the conversation. Oh my God, this conversation! So mm. we start with Eleanor looking out the window. Yeah, and Maddie reading. And yep, I, feel, I love to see Maddie reading. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. I know it's so lovely. I love the contrast of the two of them. That Matt, like here they are, like they're kind of in crisis mode right now. Oh sure, yeah. And Maddie is composed. She's sitting. She's reading a book. I feel like you know she's very much kind of inhabiting her own self uh -huh. in this moment of crisis. Sure. Mm -hmm. Whereas Eleanor is looking away from where she is. I mean, physically okay. looking away because she's looking through a window, but also because she starts the conversation and we know that she's she's doing all this kind of speculation and un yeah. being very unsure about herself sure sure um 
Okay, so she starts out by saying, it did affect me when I heard you died. And then did you notice that Maddie does this almost imperceptible head nod to her to guard? To the guy? She's such a queen, and I love her. It's amazing. I know. Yes, I did notice that. Oh, oh my Maddie. God, I love it. And that was actually, it's funny, because I kind of started to rethink the conversation on the beach based on that thing. On that little dismissal of him, uh huh, because that's when I understood that Maddie wanted Eleanor to be able to speak freely, and huh. I don't think she was doing. I mean, again, I do think she has multiple emotions happening at the same time, mm -hmm. but I think she wanted Eleanor to speak freely because she wanted to both get information about what's going on with Eleanor mm -hmm. and be able to use it. I mean, this yeah. is. Um, so, and I think knowing it, clearing him out of the space would make it more comfortable for Eleanor to speak. Yeah. And Eleanor's back, Eleanor's back had been to him. So once she turned towards Maddie, she would have seen him. Huh. Very interesting. Okay. How did you read? Why, why did you think she sent him away? Um, I, I mean, I read it for her, for her to have her privacy in a moment of vulnerability. Hmm. Although, does Maddie really have vulnerability here? Um, I don't think she got to it, but I think she wanted to give herself the space for it. Hmm. See, I, yeah, I think that she allowed Eleanor to go down that road and mm -hmm. kept herself from going down that road fully. Interesting. Yeah, I'll have to remember the whole conversation now. Okay, yeah. so let's go through the conversation. Okay, sure. so Eleanor says um, that it must have been hard for them right, and Maddie said it was hard to be without her father right but that her mother did the best that she could and Eleanor mm -hmm. said well she must have done quite well yeah which I liked that was a great moment about women yes yeah. yes right in this and place especially in this place in this place mm -hmm. and then Eleanor said I I have found myself thinking about walking away from civilization NASA England mm -hmm. and wondering can one be happy even in isolation and uncertainty, mm -hmm. but with someone you love and who loves you back. Yes. And again, this reminds me of what John said about Silver's, them. Oh, what John said? Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. and I want to bring this up. There are many types of being oh, loved like and yeah, loving sure. and being loved back that are relevant mm -hmm. here. And what John had said was that he saw them as children separated at birth and that the major right. difference between them is that Maddie grew up in a world with a mother who loved her and Eleanor grew up basically without a parent who loved her. Oh, oh, so you think that that when she was thinking about being isolated again, it has double duty. The only way yeah. she the only way she could ask Maddie if it were if it's possible is because Maddie experienced that. Right. I think that Eleanor's talking about being with Woods Rogers. I think that Eleanor's talking about right. being with Woods Rogers. Absolutely. But I thought that Maddie was likely thinking about what Silver had said when Silver said, "Would I be enough?" Absolutely. But I. But that's the beautiful thing about the way the way Eleanor framed it is that they can be talking about all of those things at once. Sure. That ultimately. The thing that Maddie's always had that Eleanor has not is being with someone you love and who loves you back. Mm -hmm. Therefore, and Eleanor's never had that. Yeah. So this is why she's so vulnerable to someone like Woods Rogers, that she, the minute she actually was offered that and that she mm -hmm. found it with someone she actually loves, like, you know, we know Max wasn't enough. Obviously, Vane wasn't enough. Right. She's so vulnerable to the point of obviously endangering herself mm -hmm. whereas maddie always had that so she comes from this place of self-assuredness where she doesn't need to talk about this she's mostly listening and i think that her reactions are very calculated because she doesn't at first say yes because i think she is thinking about silver but mm -hmm. then ultimately she does say yes because she wants to reassure eleanor right yeah, and I suppose that's all I mean to say is that she wanted to have a moment with her sister to allow her sis to, to allow Eleanor to be vulnerable and to allow at least space for herself to, even if she didn't mm -hmm. end up taking it. 
Yes. And I do think that's part of it. I do think there's another part of it where she sees someone who's potentially her enemy as well. Like you have to remember that these two women are formerly sisters, have a whole lot of hurt and like kind of childhood trauma. Right. Yeah. Well, and siblings can be so complicated anyway. Right. But they also happen to have been enemies. I mean, whether or not they are right now. But, like, wouldn't it suit Maddie? It would suit Maddie. Like, Eleanor's urge to go off and be with someone she loves and who loves her back mm-hmm. would suit the cause of the pirates oh, sure. very well. Sure. Mm-hmm. You know, Flint tried to draw Eleanor back in. For Maddie, you know. Oh, yeah. Pushing her out might be more right. helpful. Uh-huh. Again, I'm not saying it's one thing or the other. I mean, I think the what makes this scene amazing is that they are actually... When Eleanor sits down at the end of it, there is they do give each other a different look. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I feel like I watched this so many this scene I watched more times than I even watched the episode because you could spend we could spend a whole podcast episode just analyzing Maddie's face, honestly, yeah, <laughs> during no, these conversations. Sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um but I, so I think it's both. I mean, I guess I'm arguing hard on the calculating side of it because I feel like the sibling side of it is so beautiful and so heartbreaking and is the part that's obviously there. But the calculating mm-hmm. part, I think, is coexisting with the sibling part. That makes sense. Yeah. Right. This isn't a moment of like, oh, we're reunited. We're sisters. We love each other. Let's talk right. about our whole lives. Definitely not. Right. And and Eleanor asks Maddie a question that we kind of know – we kind of know her answer. Like her answer to would that be enough is no. Mm-hmm. Unless Maddie's changing her mind too. Also possible. I mean, there's just so many, there's so many variables and so many possibilities in the subtlety right. of this conversation. But, you know, last episode, Silver asked that question. And then he was like, I take it back. Basically. I don't want to, I didn't want, I don't, I take it back. The asking you of that question. I don't, I don't want to hear the answer. Right. Right. Oh, poor dear. So that's what I'm saying is like this actually, this ties so beautifully how the lack of parental love can actually put you on such bad footing for romantic love that Eleanor has all, we talked about ages ago with Eleanor is the idea that she never believed that Vane really loved her. She never believed that Max really loved her. She never believed that people, she always was like looking for the angles that people Sure. We're trying to work mm-hmm. in relation to her. When Vane said, I'm not concerned about that stuff. I'm concerned about you. She just she just refused to believe that. And right. Sure. I don't think Maddie has that problem. She mm-hmm. met Silver. She fell in love with Silver. It never occurred to her that, like, people aren't capable of loving her. Right. Yeah. But Eleanor needs this reassurance. Sure. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Eleanor makes bad choices in, re- in romance. <laughs> Yes, doesn't she just? Mm-hmm. And I think it's because she just, right. I mean, I think that there's an argument that Eleanor just never developed that capability mm-hmm. because it was so denied her. And that's the huge difference between them. Mm. They have so many similarities. Okay, right. maybe we'll move. Like, I love, I love the lighting of the fire. Yes, the light in the fire is really nice. And I it, and like I love it because they're both kind of bad at it. <laughs> and I well, kept thinking neither of them have had to do it. Yes, right. But that's what I'm saying. Uh-huh. These two women are so similar, even though they they grew mm-hmm. up so differently. They're right. so similar in that probably neither of them ever really had to light fires. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but the huge difference between them is the thing of being with someone you love and who loves you back. Hmm. Yeah. That is the difference between them. It just makes me sad for Eleanor because... I, well, as, I know! As, a, as much of an asshole as Woods Rogers turned out to be, he does love her, which I was happy to see. That's what it's... This is what's sad about Eleanor. I mean, Eleanor's yeah, death no, is so sad, but this whole, epi- yeah. this whole episode is tragic for Eleanor. Mm-hmm. We see we see sides of Eleanor that we never saw. Right yeah. before she dies. Yeah. And and it's sure. kind of like, you know, that soft inner core that some of us always thought was there. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> some yeah. of us always believed in. And we finally get to see it right before she goes and dies <laughs> on us. 
But yes, no, it, but the other aspect of the lighting, the fire is beautiful that I love that they do come together. I mean, that's the thing. Of I course. Yeah. I definitely have been stressing the calculating side of this, but this conversation did bring them together. Yes. And Eleanor did sit down at the table and they did give each other the minutest looks of like, of like, okay, we've bonded now mm-hmm. right before that. And I love like, and in Miranda's house, like this place of domesticity and womanhood to have the two of them doing, you know, right before horrible things happen, but right before horrible things happen, they're sure. doing, they're lighting the fire that was Miranda's hearth mm-hmm. where she cooked and she made tea for teacups and she- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just I love that they have this moment before yeah. you know the horrible, right? Right before everything goes just so terribly south. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, I guess we do have to talk about it. We do. First of all, did you see him in the corner first? No, I didn't. I did. Wow. I did see him in the corner first, um, which was chilling. And then when he hits her in the stomach, mm. I thought right. that was going to be as bad as it got. And that was bad enough. Right. Right. Yeah. Again, there was no music, mm-hmm. which was reminiscent of, remember when I talked about when they were going to kill Vane and I knew mm-hmm. that they were going to kill Vane because of what mm-hmm. they did with the soundtrack. It yep. was like that again. Like I knew how bad this was going to go. And we have just done a couple of episodes where we talked about the combat being strange and the Uh violence being too much. Mm -hmm. And this, I thought, was perfectly done. It was perfect, right? It was perfect. I watched with my hands over my mouth. I watched feeling like I was there or like I was a part of it Mm -hmm. or like I was Eleanor even. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't so much that I felt the compulsion to look away. Yep, exactly. It was right. really beautifully done. And, uh, and and that, I think, goes throughout this entire episode. All of the mm-hmm. combat for this episode was perfect. Like, I felt that I was in it. It was very suspenseful, but I never felt that it was so over the top that I had to look away. It never threw me out of the action because it was too much. Yep, so, I agree. So, yeah, this was beautifully done and chilling. Um, also... Frequently, I find that the threat of rape is unnecessary and over the top and overblown. Mm-hmm. And here I did not. Um, Agreed. With this historical context, it was mm-hmm. exactly what you would expect to have happened. And Eleanor's fierceness, her ferocity, her... Incredible. The way she was just scrambling mm-hmm. was... Right. No, it it all felt it felt so true. correct is the wrong world. Yeah, true. Yeah, it felt true. it felt like that's exactly how it would have been. Mm-hmm. I'm very pleased that we had the hint of the threat of rape because without that it would have been unrealistic. Right. Because otherwise why wouldn't he just have killed them to begin with? You know what I mean? Like he sure, if yeah. all he wanted to do was just kill them, he could have done that. Right. Well, we had had those um, leader of the forces, whatever it was, the Spanish general saying, we've turned them loose now. Right. There's no exactly. stopping them right. now. And Which is what Rogers basically told them to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That that they have requested, uh, what was that line that we had back a, a, a while before? These are dark times that call mm-hmm. for dark deeds done mm-hmm. by dark men. Like right. that's where we are now. Like we've released the most animalistic carnal primal urges mm-hmm. of these men we've taken away that part you know the, what we talked about civilization having many faces right, right. Like, this is not the act of civilized men anymore this is right. at their most primal right and it's not disciplined warfare this is just gangs like bands yes. bands of soldiers also i really wanted to bring up and i had forgotten earlier to bring this up i want to bring up when eleanor like remember when when Flint was bombing the fort and Eleanor went to Miranda to try to talk her into getting Flint to stop. Yes. Mm-hmm. She described exactly this. 
She said, we need the fort. And she explained, she described to Miranda the Rosario Raids, which she was a little oh, girl. Oh, yes, this, that's right. The Rosario right, Raids yes. is when her mother died. The Rosario oh, Raids is God. when she yes. thought Maddie and her mother had died. Mm-hmm. This I forgot about that. That's a great point. So just the tying together of threads of Eleanor dying from a similar raid, basically at the hands of her husband that he thought he was doing or convinced himself he was doing to save her. Right. And that it happened in the house where she, I mean, that was one of Eleanor's moments of absolute desperation when she was trying to describe this to Miranda to try to motivate Miranda to convince Flint. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just, um, I just found that so moving. I mean, it's, it's horrible obviously, but I just found the kind of the poetry, the, the the sad tragic poetry of of this happening to Eleanor in this house this mm. that's again it's was once a safe haven right also it was ha- sanctuary right mm. also happened to be the place where where Eleanor really allowed herself to be emotional about that very type of raid mm mm-hmm it's very chilling to me the the yes. full the full circleness of yeah. of all yeah. of these I elements put that's together that's a great point yeah i mean again already when he went to havana you know of course i thought about the rosario raids and how eleanor's biggest fear has always been the return of spain yes but to have, now we know why well and, yeah yeah because yeah. it is different when you hear the stories than right. when you see it no, absolutely. Yeah. And but that's ex- this is exactly what she described to Miranda was yes. just bands of soldiers going around raping and killing. Yes. I know. I just uh thank you show for killing Eleanor in just I, I feel like the most bizarrely the most meaningful way possible. Like it's it, sure. it she died in a way that's completely divorced of all the reasons we thought she was going to die all of her own machinations and but that's kind of perfect too is that she tried so hard all these all these seasons all this time to keep control and in the end she died in a situation that was so out of her control Mm -hmm. yes this had nothing to Although, do with again, anything she, was, she did. She fought beautifully through this scene. No, though. no, of course. I was so proud of her. The, from from the gun, she was so resourceful to the gunshot and the mm-hmm. and the sword um, and and the sword and the kerosene mm-hmm. and then the presence of mind to reach for the fire, remembering that he was soaked in the kerosene. Um, oh God, it was all beautiful completely agree with you but i like that the show didn't kill her in a way to say to her like this is what you get for being the woman who did all of those things you you know what i mean right yeah that's what i'm saying is that it's funny part of me did want her to have you know retribution for killing vain and all this but in the end i realized that the most perfect thing was for her to die not because of the things she did as you know, Eleanor, the queen of thieves or Eleanor, right. the, mm-hmm. the fence or Eleanor, the, the tyrant. Right. She didn't die for any of those things. Mm. She died for love in a lot of ways, which is just a million times worse. Yes. Cause it's yeah. like the one no, thing Eleanor see. didn't have the one thing that Eleanor struggled for the whole time. Mm. And, and yeah. That- Again, with the cinematography there, when she got the slash across her belly, and she'd already been hit in the stomach, and then she slashed across her belly. We still don't know that she's going to die, but by this time, we're... Oh, I was sure she was going to die then. That was a lot of blood. It was. It was a lot, but, you know, I'm... Yeah, it it was. But I was certain, at least, that the baby was gone, that, that, you know, between the punch in the stomach and now the slash, like, that's it, that she's lost this child. Yeah. So, but then again, that uh, the, the shot from beneath mm-hmm. Eleanor as she's stumbling above us was yeah. uh, just gorgeously done. Okay. Well, and in all of this, we've not talked about Maddie. Yeah. Well, Maddie went down quickly. Uh, she got what the fireplace poker, mm-hmm. and which is always something that they say um, to women in particular when, when going up against someone uh, who is ha- has more strength than you is don't give them 
mm-hmm. a weapon mm-hmm. by and it's god it's so hard to see um that she does what she can she does what she's capable of and it's not enough in this moment and it's i have to now insert for the first time ever in our podcast my husband has asked me to insert his opinion wow okay well i like you doobie okay what do you got to say he doesn't think maddie's dead oh i don't either Oh, that's so cool. No, show me a smoking corpse and I'll say that Maddie's dead. Otherwise, (laughs) no. So, oh, okay. I'm psyched. Okay, great. Yay. I mean, I don't know how. I don't know how she gets out of the house. I don't know. (laughs) I was hoping at first that maybe her guy that she sent outside wasn't dead, but he was actually the first one we saw. And then the other guy. He's full on dead. Yeah. No. Yes. So I don't, I don't know how, but yeah, until... You know, we saw Eleanor with like flies on the corpse. Yeah, yeah, no, for we sure. Did no, not no, there's see no Maddie question. in that way, and I am just, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. Okay, awesome. And maybe, maybe, I mean, I'm not putting past the writers that she is dead, but I'll believe it when I see it. I will choose to believe that too. Oh, I don't know if you should. I mean, I'm just saying that I don't believe that she's dead. I didn't say I believe she's alive. <laughs> so I don't believe that she's dead. <laughs> You know, I just I like that option better. So I'm just going to blindly follow that. I I don't know. I mean, it was just like like Schrodinger's Maddie. (laughs) (laughs) I just I I kind of I need I need I need her to be alive or something. Mm -hmm. I just I need a little bit more of her. Yeah, I'm not saying I I, yeah, I'm not saying she's going to survive to the end, but I I'm not ready for her to go yet. (laughs) All right. Well, then uh, we'll just have to see about that part. I'm fascinated. I love that both of you think she's alive or not dead. I'm not sure what that means. Yeah. If if, I'm not sure what 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 where exactly is that place between alive and not dead? That's that's where that's where Anne is right now. (laughs) Is in the hammock of the ship. Yes, a similar place. I I'll take that. I would take Mm -hmm. that over dead. All right, so now we the last thing we have to talk about is the scene where Flint comes and finds Eleanor. Mm, which is so beautiful. Uh, I, gosh, he right. barely has time to register that this place that was his home is mm-hmm. burning when he sees Eleanor and goes to her. I think he knows immediately that she is dead. Oh, you know, yeah. She, yeah. 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 Um, and we do too. God, she looks awful yep yeah um but i love this it's so reminiscent to her last words with Vane, um because she asks was he there my husband was he there Mm -hmm. and flint says no which is such a mercy to her i know and i think of her screaming in that cell Mm -hmm. and turning from Vane and saying you don't understand what you took from me and Mm -hmm. why it was good Mm -hmm. but flint understands what he gives to her and why it is good. Mm, that's a beautiful way to put it. Yes. Which makes me ask, is Flint our new cinnamon roll? What is happening? I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, Flint, you're too good for this world. So sweet, so pure. What is happening? Turn everything on its ear. Season four, what are you doing? I know. Yeah, season four. God, yeah. If ever a season of television was just like, let's take all of your expectations and just like... Right? And like, fuck with them, but fuck with them in a way that totally works. Like, there's... It's like, we're shocked, and yet it's all totally believable. No, somehow, yeah, this even is, though I don't this even is know the why. best parts of Flint. I mean, he was floundering after his lo- loss of Miranda. I wouldn't even call it floundering, just sinking. He was sinking after he lost right. Miranda right. and giving up. And now he has something to believe in again. I believe in his friendship and his loyalty to Silver. Mm-hmm. And I believe in his love and affection for Maddie and for Eleanor. Yep. And I don't quite know how he found those things again. But he has them now. And God, when he says, in this episode too, when he says, um, get everybody to the ship and those who can't make it, I want them carried. I'll leave no one behind. I'll leave no one behind. Who's that guy? Who is that guy? But I love him. (laughs) 
I know. He's our okay. sweet cinnamon roll. Yes. Okay. I love Ra- Flint. What is going on? <laughs> James Flint cinnamon roll. Right. Okay. Oh, also there's a Hamill sales moment right right here, right? What? Death does not discriminate between the sinners and the saints. It takes oh. and it takes and it takes. We keep fighting anyway. <laughs> so true. Oh my God. <sighs> oh mm. yeah. Heart heart shattering to a million pieces. You can't hear it through the yeah. microphone, but it's happening. Mm-hmm. I know. I'm so engaged with this Flint. It's so yes. interesting. It's like no, I haven't. I haven't been this engaged with Flint since season two. Not that I. Uh huh. Oh, that's interesting. See, in season three, Didn't... I was super engaged with like, like crazy going down. Sure. Like, yeah, and I the mean, darkness compelled Flint. by yes, but I, this is the first time I am rooting for him again in the way that mm. I was in season two. Sure, sure, sure. Which was not what I was expecting. No, I was thinking that they were going to really pack the torch to silver. Right. And we would kind of lose our affections for Flint. Mm. So. Well, in a lot of ways, they, in some ways, you could say they've patched, they've passed the torch to silver. And that's what's allowing us to have affection for Flint. Could be. Could be. All right. Let's talk about that. Oh, actually, I just turned the page and now we're at silver and Flint. So let's start talking about Okay, but we're sure. not starting. We're not starting with actually silver and flint because we have a whole lot of silver before flint shows up. Oh, okay. So starting with silver, sure, sure. Yeah. So we're gonna start with silver. So we're gonna start he starts now. Out the episode. Yes, he starts out the episode. Uh, well, what starts out the episode is the breaking of bonds, and I love that. Yep, pretty gorgeous. And what I really love about it, I mean, mm-hmm. I love that it's happening. Obviously. Sure. Well, yes. Mm-hmm. What I love about it visually and in an audio sort of way is that it's, it is the mirror of the whipping with the switch. Oh, it sure is. Yeah. We hear it it first. We hear it before we see it. Good call. I didn't notice that. Yeah. And that it's a rhythmic thing that it's something that uh is very like that musical note again. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I did not, I didn't, I didn't play them next to each other, but I could have, but I think that the, (laughs) I just have a, a feeling. Or whatever it was. I, <laughs> I have a feeling that the tempo is identical or very mm-hmm. close to identical sure mm-hmm. of the whipping with the switch and the breaking of the bonds. Sure. And I wow. love that mm-hmm. very that much. Beautiful. That makes me happy. Also, Ruth. Ruth just makes me happy. I she's really great. like Ruth. Right. Yeah. yeah, she's great. Well, and this this one this is a scene that changes so much after you've already seen the episode. Because the first time, uh, the first time I thought of it as, um, oh, her saying that these people were tortured as a result of your actions, which is just, you know, bringing out that, that quartermaster heart that Silver has for his men and for his people, you know, that, that he, his actions, like when he saw, uh, Muldoon's death, right. You know, because of the choices that he has made. But then the second time around, when you know that he's going to lose Maddie, and they say, or that he's going to believe that he loses Maddie, mm-hmm. and um, she, he, he says, well, I imagine, or she says, is there anything that could happen, you know, right. that could make it any better? He says, no, but I imagine that getting my hands on the man responsible for it would help. And that, I think, is foreshadowing. He must blame... Woods Rogers, don't you think? Absolutely. For Maddie's death? Yeah. Well, correctly. So correctly re- so. Yes, correctly. Correctly. So huh. I'm ready to see that. Hmm. Wow. Right. Right. Because we know that he doesn't blame Flint. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Yes. Oh, that was so sweet. Uh, I have a lot to we'll say about to that, that scene. Yeah. We're about to get to that. Yeah. But he does offer up Billy. And I've got to say, like, uh, this felt to me very reminiscent of our other characters throughout this season who have said maybe we could heal people by offering up I know, the person that they see as the offender. <clears throat> this is what they wanted to do. Like, this is what they said with Max, that they wanted to, oh, they wanted sure, to offer up yeah. silver. Okay, yeah, okay. And that Behringer uh-huh. wanted the public hangings. Right. This is I what see. Billy wanted sure, to do with sure. Max. Billy okay. wanted to offer up Max to the pirates because mm-hmm. she because she did something against them. Yeah. This is the first time Silver has wanted to do something like this. Mm. Well, I don't know. I think of the time he had his man beaten 
Right. So it's also reminiscent of that. Yes. No, absolutely. But this was, I just felt like in this season, this was reminiscent of that. I think Mm -hmm. he sees it as similar to the Dobbs situation. Right. Yes. And I think he makes that explicit when he's talking to Billy. But I just thought it was interesting in the context of the other people who make up, offer up a person Mm -hmm. retribution for the sake of peacemaking, which again, so far in this season, not worked out well for people. Right. Mm -hmm. And a sign of darkness, I think. This is the kind of thing Max argues against. I think that we should gauge all behaviors on whether Max would approve of it or not. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) I, you know, they're probably, we probably have a lot of listeners who are going to disagree with me and feel free to email me, but I think this is my new gauge. My new gauge for all behaviors is would Max do it? Would Max argue against it? Mm, Probably just, just everyone just listen to Max already. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the, and the other thing I thought of was like, oh, my God, Billy, torture. I mean, this isn't torture yeah. like the like torture from, but, Not you know, torture, but a beating again. Sure. Mm. Right. Right. So Silver is subject. Yeah. Uh, you know, he is now. Happily, subject- that's for sure. Again, I don't you know, I'm not happy with Billy. I'm still really, really mad at Billy. I'm no, I'm really mad at Billy. I know we're no, about to talk to Tom, I, but yeah, I'm super sure. mad at Billy. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. The thing that I love about Billy is that Billy is standing in his truth. <laughs> like, it's not my truth. <laughs> it's not the truth. But he is standing in his truth. And I do appreciate that about him. He has his own compass, his own level of integrity, and he is holding to it. And holding but strong. is he? But is he? Yeah. He hung, he hung some of his own men this season. I don't know. I'm going to argue. Remind me I'm why gonna... he did that? Because they well, had... because because they were informants for Beringer, but still, like okay, because they were complete traitors to his okay. cause. All right, you're right. You're right. Right. He, I just the part the part of Billy's standing in his truth that bothers me is like mm-hmm. okay, sure, he's loyal to his men, but he keeps redefining who that is. Yes. So that's the that's where no, I know. I'm not saying that I agree with him. <laughs> I'm right. not saying I'm on Team Billy. I'm just saying. Right. He's not the righteous he, one here. But he believes himself to be, which is sure. interesting to watch and dangerous Fine. and compelling. Super dangerous. Yes. Super okay. dangerous. Yes. But aren't all of, I mean, that's all of our guys. That's what they're all doing in black sales. That's everybody. Yeah. Except, you know what? I, <sighs> it's just that Billy is not as good at it. Billy's right. perspective is. Right. He's not as good at it. You're right. He's, You're right. He's not as good at any of it. He's not as no. good at his, he's not as good at the storytelling. He's not certainly not as good a leader and not as good at narrativizing his own experience. Right. <laughs> mm, interesting. Uh, but when he says here with Silver, oh, he yeah. says you made your choice, live with it. Yep. I respect that. I do too. I totally respect that. Right. And that's the thing is Silver came into this conversation, I think, thinking he was going to get another Dobbs reaction. Yes. Uh-huh. He sure and did. he did not and he didn't get, get it. No. no, and he didn't because, get it. Because, again, Billy is in Billy's truth. Right. Billy no, created no. Silver. He's not right. under the same spell that everybody else is. Right. Right. And in, Zetu, and in Zetu's language, Billy's not a groupie. He's uh-huh. not, he's not yep. a silver groupie. He is not a silver groupie. You're absolutely right. I mean, he created, he created, he created the, the myth. whole thing. But he created that. I mean, now we understand he created that because that was like a shell story for his own leadership. Oh, uh huh, yeah. Not because he actually himself believes in silver. I mean, That's he knows true. who silver. I mean, he remembers silver like hallucinating oh, and sure. squeezing eels. He does. <laughs> he, does. <laughs> yes, he sure does. <laughs> yeah, and not to mention early silver that he pushes the hand off. Right. The shoulder, oh my god, it's one of you, my favorite gifts. You know how I love to use that gift. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a good one. So, yeah, but I do like, I mean, but they're really interesting parts of this conversation. Like, Silver does make a good point. I love when he says that he says, Flint is my friend, but I know who he is. Mm -hmm. And for all of his offenses, he never made me choose between you and him. Yes. You made me choose that. Which is actually reminiscent to me of all the many threesomes that we've had in this. Uh In this series, yeah. This series is just chock-a-block threesomes. (laughs) Chock-a-block threesomes. Can that be the name of this episode, please? (laughs) 
<laughs> I'll put that in. I'll put that in the description. We don't really we we name them Roman numerals, but I'll definitely. Put oh that yeah, in the exactly, description. exactly. <laughs> uh. But you know, but I felt like that was actually. I I feel like Silver actually in this episode inadvertently shows his hand mm-hmm. in in this conversation and his conversation with Julius. Like he's showing. He's doing power speak, like he's doing like storyteller, pirate theater, I'm being, sure. but he's showing his hand, I feel like in ways that he didn't, int- that he didn't intend to, um, because this idea of choosing between them, like Billy mm-hmm. doesn't give a shit about that. Silver cares about this. And this is interesting. And I don't, I haven't really figured out why I think this is so important to mm-hmm. Silver, but I think despite the person Silver was, and all of his protestations, I think Billy and and Flint are actually really important to Silver. Yes. No. Like of, super yes, important. Yes, they absolutely are. They absolutely are. Community in general is very important to Silver because he was such a loner for right. so long. Right. And look what he gave up for it. And it's just really interesting. Like, I think Billy is way more important to Silver then silver, then silver is, is to, to Billy. Billy. Absolutely. And he showed that in this yeah. room where he's trying to show he's trying to show Billy how powerful he is. Well, and I think he also sincerely wants reconciliation. He does, but he's pretending not because also like the next thing he says is he says you paid for your you know, you made a mistake, you paid for your mistake, but you're an asset to me. An asset to this war, right? Right, which is exactly what Billy said to Flint. Like, those are not the words of a friend. Those are the words of a strategist. Yeah, it's true. true. He's trying to play that game. He's trying to be, again, he's trying to do the Dobbs thing. Absolutely, he is to Billy. Yeah, I I just meant, like, the character's actual motivations. Right, but that's what I'm saying, is that Silver's giving, he's giving away way more than I think he thinks he is. Oh, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I just, I think it's really interesting. He's way more emotionally, he's being way more emotionally open here than I think he thinks mm-hmm. he's being. He thinks right. he's being just like strategic leader guy. You know, and he says, he's like, okay, well, those guys had their pound of flesh, and my guys, our guys, like... <laughs> I could say anything to them. Yeah. Which was funny because you know what he said is that I could tell them that the sky was red, which remember those things where the actors were reading the tweets? Yeah. He definitely said, said that. I Somebody know. Said that. And Luke Arnold was just like, ah, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I know. Yeah. I know. I just, just to give everyone some context, we just both rewatched the video where where yeah, Charlie, uh-huh. our yes. Chumbucka Charlie, uh-huh. called Billy a sweet cinnamon roll. Which led to all of this game. And yes, you must be so right. proud, Chumbucka Charlie. I would be. Yes, you should be. I mean, mm-hmm. you're awesome in general, but mm-hmm. also for this. But yeah, how weird that that that's like random fan tweeted that about this about being able to tell people the sky is red. That yeah. is so weird. That, yeah. Yep. That was a lovely irony. Uh-huh. I will put the link. Well, I guess I'll put the link now in both episodes in this one and in the Tom episode. But um, (laughs) what's neat here is that Silver, he's playing at this guy in this episode. Like, I feel like he's playing at King better than he's actually being King. Oh, uh interesting. Yeah. And right. And Billy comes out of this conversation in his like basically saying, fuck off. He he's. Mm -hmm. He actually kind of comes out on top of this conversation, you know, despite the fact that he's in a shed bound and right. <laughs> but like, remember the last time Silver had Billy bound was like in that shed after he emerged from oh, having, right, yeah, right? out of the water. I can't let you go until I know what you're going to say. Uh-huh. Right, and that was when Silver said, you know, that's where he did the liked and feared thing. Yeah, in that right. conversation when Silver still didn't give a shit about anything except himself. He uh-huh. totally came on out on top of that situation. Yeah. This one, where he is nominally on top of the world, yes. I feel like Billy actually kind of gets the better of him. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Mm. Yep. Okay, let's move on to the next Silver conversation, where he's okay. like, he's in a nice fucking chair, isn't he? I wrote that down. I didn't write he's in a nice fucking chair. But I wrote, where'd this chair come from? It's another chair. <laughs> 
And Max talks about chairs later. Yeah, yes, she shows. does. They know what they're doing. Yeah, where did Silver's chair come from? That's my note. <laughs> I feel like we need to someday like make a book of like the words that pop up all the time in in black sales and like uh -huh. and then we could catalog all the places where they sh where that thing shows up because like chairs a job for you daphne <laughs> I... okay fine That's cool. <laughs> i am giant pirate nerd and i just i'm not ashamed i'm okay. not ashamed Good. at no, all sh no no shame <laughs> i know no shame about that <laughs> <laughs> excellent well, we started with Hornigold's chair. I love chairs in this show. No, it's true. Chairs. Yeah, you're it's right. a really big deal. And often mm -hmm. they're really pretty. Often. Yes, quite. <laughs> this one's very pretty. Mm -hmm. um, okay, sorry. Silver in his fucking chair. Yes. Yeah, I just loved how staged this was. This was like full on pirate theater. Absolutely it was. Uh huh. <laughs> yes. And yet. I'm going to argue again that Julius kind of gets the better of Silver no, of in this course conversation. He does. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I do like that he points out that man was a friend of mine before you question the sacrifice. But yeah, when Julius says, among the pirates, loyalty changes quickly, it seems. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, you're not wrong. No, you're not wrong. Well, yeah. I also love, I feel like, you know, Silver starts with this whole thing about, you know, you know that we must bond together to free the new world you know big big plans mm -hmm. i'm regal the thing that's interesting to me is that when julius says you know wait how long would we be partners exactly because i think you just tossed out the other guy yeah silver i feel like is kind of misunderstanding julius's point like silver says you know he brings up this you know before you question it before you question the sacrifice, he's talking about his own sacrifice. Mm. And Julius is like, sorry, dude, I don't really give a shit about your sacrifice. What I'm talking about is who I'm going to be dealing with. Oh, uh-huh. You see what I'm saying? Like, I think Silver was very caught up with, like, what this means for him, for, for him. Silver. Yeah, sure. And course. Julius is like, I don't actually care about your sacrifice. Mm -hmm. That's not what is concerning me. What's concerning me is how long will your promises last for my yes. people? Yes. Mm -hmm. So again, this is Silver like doing pirate theater. Yeah. No, he was very lucky that the situation got as out of hand as it did, where his argument was basically, we all die or we bond together. And right. Julius was like, well, let's do it then. Because no, he did not win any kind of argument other than this is the only option that we have. Right. Well, that's only because of Spain. But like yes. he based on his own thing that he was trying to his yeah. own points he was making. Again, he got yeah, he caught up in his over. own emotions about mm -hmm. his loyalty to his friends. Right. And that wasn't even remotely what Julius was concerned about, nor should he have been. Like, why does he give a shit? Right. Exactly. I mean, again, mm -hmm. it was almost it was almost for me like hands like slapping silver around again. It's yes. Like, it was just yes. like, seriously, dude, who cares oh, about God, you and your that friends? Was so cool. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. That was last episode. But it was like, we don't care about you and your friends. Yeah. Julius is like, I have people I'm responsible for. I yeah. would like to know if this coalition is for real before mm -hmm. I start risking their lives. Mm -hmm. So I just like, Silver, pull yourself together, dude. You're supposed to be king right now. You're just right. You're Absolutely. Not, oh, you're just man. like way mm -hmm. too touchy feely right now to be like kingly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel yeah. for him. I love Silver. You know, I love Silver. Oh, and like course. all of yeah. these conflicts. Really, I feel for him so much with well, all remember, these Remember, he never conflicts. wanted this. He never he wanted didn't. this role. No, he didn't. He didn't want this role. And he tried last episode to maybe, like, bitch sure, it all and run away with did. his girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Luke Arnold breaks my heart in this episode. Uh, right? Uh, oh, my. Yeah, we haven't gotten there yet. But, yeah, oh, my God. Him. I know. Well, you know, when we have him back on, you can blow him kisses remotely through the computer. Excellent. <laughs> or you Best could just, I can do. or you Best can just can say do. that, and he will have heard it, and so now go. he knows that you're really feeling for him. Kisses, Luke. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. I just right. I just okay. I'm gonna save the other thing. I want to say. You know what? I'm not gonna save the other thing. Perhaps our biggest problem here is that. Flint and Silver haven't actually been in the same place a lot. Like this whole thing about oh, like yeah. the S two of us working together. Uh-huh, sure. And so 
maybe what I have to say is this whole twin speech in the first episode wasn't 100% about Silver doing bad things to Flint. Maybe it really mm-hmm. was about that they're like two halves of the same person and they need each other to work. Mm, yeah, sure. They do work very well together. They work very well together. And I've heard that people, people really follow them and do what they want when they're working together. Uh, I have heard that. Yeah. Funny. And that when there's no daylight between them, they parent everyone really well. <laughs> uh huh. Even their surly teenager. Even their surly teenager, kind of. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I'm just really feeling this thing that like, okay, let's move on to the next. Okay. Well, let's, yes, let's I have yeah, no we'll, notes we'll about the battle. I have no notes about the battle, except for the fact that Hans is the one who calls retreat again. Oh, fascinating. Silver makes the decision to stand their ground, which is a good decision yeah. and a big decision and a very leaderly decision. Oh, I love the suspense of the battle. The soldiers bursting through the sugarcane is amazing. And the way they did the, everything again with the sound before that, with Silver hearing them and not mm-hmm. sure, and then the muffled sounds and him straining. Mm-hmm. The suspense was killing me. It was gorgeous. When they busted through, it was, I mean, this was epic. It was a movie. It was not TV. Yeah. It was gorgeous. I know. It's so mm-hmm. true. I love Silver with his three guns on the front. Um, yes. Uh-huh. Oh, and the slaves arriving and him, and him yelling, open the doors. Yeah. Ah. Right. That was awesome. No. no, it was incredible. Right. And the danger of, of the riders with, with torches like that. I don't yes, know if everyone yes, understands that. But when you're... Torches, aim for the torches. Right. Yes. Because if you're in an enclosed wooden building and they come yep. with torches, you're done for. Yep. Oh. And at this point, we've already seen Miranda's house burning. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. I, I believe so. so. Mm-hmm. I know. See, this is where I do the character thing and it messes I know, up. I know. I know. Never... I, I, I feel like yes. I'm not sure. It's though. always, it's, uh, yeah, it's always a debate between what, know, how the I scenes know. relate to each other and just keeping the characters so that sure. we can really just talk about their progression. Um, but the three guns really works for me, be, partly because, I mean, Silver, obviously, in you know, with the one leg, guns makes more sense for him than a sword, really, even sure. though we've had him doing some sword stuff. But for me, it also works because the other person we've seen with the three guns attached to his front is Teach. Is Teach. Yep. Mm-hmm. And what I love about that is that, like all things of Black Sails, when you have a parallel, the differences is what is what really stands out for me. Mm-hmm. I love the difference between the way Teach shoots people in the way silver shoots people out huh. you know teach always had this nonchalance to his yes, fighting right certainly. we've mm-hmm. definitely talked about that before and it was super fun and i felt like that was a great part of his character it's just mm-hmm. like i'm so badass i don't even have to try yes mm-hmm. silver is so intense with his i mean it can't be intense the way the way people with two legs you know the way vane would be intense or or Flint would be intense in his fighting, but he's so intense when he pulls those guns out. And I really love that contrast to teach that right. there's this similar, I mean, a similarity. I love any similarities between them because old mm-hmm. King, new King. Right. But, of course. But the differences then really show how different their personalities are. Yeah. That silver's trying so hard mm-hmm. and my heart breaks for him a million times more because of it. Oh, this just does yeah. not come easily to him. He's he has such so many skills mm-hmm. that make it possible for him to do this, but he still it's just he just he cares too much. Teach yeah. he doesn't have that thing that Teach had. Just like Flint didn't right. have the te- thing that Teach had, where Teach is like, whatever, go fight in the street so that you can deserve my recognition. Uh huh. Yeah. Our walrus guys. Oh, he had that soft spot for his, well, his nine lives and. Uh, <laughs> and for Vane. <laughs> and for Vane. Yes. Uh-huh. Right. Yes. No, that's true. No, I'm not saying that Teach didn't give a shit about anything, but but he was just so, yeah. I mean, and again, I mean, I think part of that was his persona, but I think part of it was true mm-hmm. that Teach just, he just didn't really give a shit, you yeah. know? and. And Silver has given up so much to be where he is. He gives a shit so much. He mm-hmm. cares so deeply. Yes. Yes. I know. My poor boy. Okay, now we're after the battle and Flint arrives. 
and mm, and then they both break my heart into a million pieces because pretty much Luke Arnold, Toby Stevens, you're so good. God, they're so good. Breaking my heart. We've seen Flint sad many times, right? Sad, horrified, yeah. whatever. This was sure. a new face. No, it was. It was. Right? And he did not want to tell him. Oh, uh, no, it was beautiful. And, I and know. Luke Arnold just breaking. Oh, Yeah, Luke Arnold <laughs> yeah, collapsing and then Flint taking over with Dooley. And this is what made me think about this, about the two of them uh -huh. together, is that when Dooley comes and needs instruction. Yeah. Silver can't do it. And Flint has been allowing yeah. Silver to be that person pretty much, you know, this most of this season. Silver yes. couldn't do it. Flint takes over. I mean, I was just like, this mm -hmm. is it. They're just, they're tag teaming. When they're together, yes. they yeah. can tag team in this way. Partnership. Mm -hmm. Right. Finally, this partnership Finally. that's been yeah. hinted at from the very beginning, like it actually is a thing now. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. I mean, it's just, it's just downright gorgeous. Yeah. The yeah, way these two are. Okay, so let's yeah, let's move on to on on the walrus and silver sitting okay. at the desk. Just the look on his face. I mean, that's it. He that uh, that is yeah. The... No, that <sighs> again. Uh, all I can say is, ah, uh, Luke Arnold. No, it's so beautiful. It's it is that look. It's exactly looks... that look. And also he's props shattered. to the makeup team because he looks yeah. haggard. like he's gone yeah. through, he looks so haggard. Like he's gone three or four days without sleep. Right. No. And yeah. he looks like someone who's been crying for like a good 24 hours. Yeah. Whatever oh, makes someone look God. like that. Cause he's not actually crying, but he looks. I just want to hold looks... him and be his mom. I know. Well, you yeah. know, he's got Flint who holds his shoulder. <laughs> it's true. Flint does at least touch his shoulder, which is lovely. Oh, and the extra heartbreak he gets when he says, do you really think they just, and Flint says, abandoned us? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Which no sign of Rackham. Oh. Yep. I, yeah, I love this conversation. I love the compassion that Flint yep. has. But Me what too. I love most, like most in the world, mm -hmm. and this has brought another thing full circle, is that Silver, who at the end of season three, basically blamed Flint for somehow killing all the people close to him. Oh, that's right. Yeah. He says it's not your fault. Like he yeah. took away that thing that he said. He, ba you yes, know, he basically said, that's right. he basically said you were the end of these people who are close to you. And now he said, I know it's not your fault. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Daphne. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that recognition is so meaningful to me. Yeah, that's it's it. We're the Flint too, I think. Absolutely, yeah. it is, mm -hmm. and that's it. It's just like this was the final barrier. I felt like you know, in three ten, they had this you know this very important conversation where they reached a level of closeness they never had because of yes. Flint telling his story. Mm -hmm. But this is where I feel like Silver truly reciprocated because he he's let go of seeing Flint as as a force, as an object, mm -hmm. as a yeah. thing to deal with. Mm -hmm. And he sees him as a person. He doesn't yeah. see him anymore as an archetype. He sees him as a man. Mm -hmm. That's good. And, um, and this is uh, the last thing I want to say is what I've been wanting to say about Flint, gent this gentle Flint. I think this has to do with this partnership is that perhaps when Flint unburdened himself and told Silver his secrets, mm -hmm. maybe that was all Flint needed. He needed a partner. He didn't, he hadn't had it. And that that partnership and being able to divide the responsibility mm -hmm. and, and the burden with yeah, this other person, equal. Mm -hmm. right, is what has given him the freedom to be softer to yes. be and we'll just have to see how this plays out and so that's what i'm saying about this twin thing that maybe this is actually for now at least who knows what's going to happen in the next four episodes but at this moment the twin thing is about actually supporting each other and making each other whole right wow yeah i like that a lot all right let's move on to gen x 
where I get oh. to talk about Max. I am ready That's, to talk about Max. Max so. is killing it in this episode. And right? not only that, but loving this costume. Yeah, it's pretty fantastic. Mm. She just got on the ship with the one costume, so chances are we're going to see it for a while. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I would also like to say from the get-go that this is my favorite of Jessica Parker Kennedy's performance. Amazing. Amazing. She is beautiful in this episode. Yeah. She's so amazing. Good. Yeah. Right. Yes. Um, yes. She's amazing. Okay. And it starts with her at the fort. So before the Jack parts, sure. although, although yes. the Jack and Max parts are my favorite parts, but yeah, where she's she starts, just, just pissed that she she's is just, the she's only just one done with everyone. Here. She's just yeah, like, she's fuck so you all. I you. am yes. done. Exactly. <laughs> and you see it on her face, like her determination as she walks out of there and, and seeing her on the horse and with the cannons going behind her. It's mm. okay. Can I just recognize that? Like Jessica said, at New York Comic Con, she's like, I finally got to ride a horse. It seems oh, that this yeah. whole time she's like been begging for a horse and she oh. finally. So I just want to say, Jessica Barker Kennedy, I am so pleased that you got to ride a horse. Yep, nailed it. And you, yeah, <laughs> right. You did it with style. Yep, style and class. Style and class. But I love that, that Roger's advisors recognize whatever that he, you know, this is him, that he did his yes. signals. And she's the only one who's like, what about Eleanor? And they're like, oh, yeah. it'd be suicide to go try to save her. And she's like, yeah, fuck that. I'm going to go save her. Yep. Which is amazing. Not that that works out for her. Although, Doesn't work did you out. you notice that she says several times Eleanor is dead? Mm-hmm. How does she know? She says Eleanor is dead after Flint got onto the walrus. Oh. I checked that. She knows. Yes, she kn- right. Course. It's okay. after they picked okay. up the stragglers like, from the how beach. Is she sh- how is she so sure? Okay. Flint. Of course. Her Flint has course. reunited okay. with Rackham. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I know. I did check that because I was like, okay. wait a minute. But then I checked. Yeah, it. Al- okay. she's always saying it after Flint's already on the ship. Got it. Okay. All right. So Max on horse, cannon. Yeah, that thing where she's on that path and then you hear the cannons and it's just like, uh, it's, it's really all haunting. behind her. Yeah, it is. Oh, it's gorgeous. Beautiful yeah, with headphones too. It's really too. gorgeous. Watch with headphones. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Watch with headphones. Definitely. Uh-huh. Okay. And then she arrives at the beach where Jack's with his dudes. And Jack and is just looking so changed and so haggard, isn't he? Mm-hmm. He has yes. aged 10 years since he saw this know, happen to Anne. It's so true. It really is true. Okay. So he sees Max and then he does the... Okay. I just want to say Megan at Ithaca. Ithaca. Uh-huh. This one's for you, what I'm about to say. Jack does that thing where he touches his facial hair and it's amazing. <laughs> he has this beautiful tick where he, mm-hmm. you know, we, Megan and I both adore this, where he strokes his, his uh, mustache or uh-huh. does, he just, he just, it's just a thing he does. And it's so expressive. So he sees Max and the first thing he does is he just kind of strokes his eyebrow a little bit. Mm-hmm. And mm. I just, I love it because it feels so true. Yeah. I also love it because that could have meant a million things. Sure. Like sure. that could be Jack thinking, that could be Jack doing like a tiny bit of minute grooming before sure. he sees uh-huh. Max sure. again. Because like, God forbid he see Max for the first time in a long time and not be, you know, and he's, he's, he's not looking his best right now. Right. Again, quite <laughs> haggard. Uh-huh. Been through I a just, lot. I just love it so dearly. I love this thing about Jack. Um, okay, so then Max comes up, and she's she is n- she is not contrite. She is the no, opposite. No, yes. And she's like, I came to find Eleanor, and then he's like, he then Jack just goes into his little fantasy thing about what he always imagined Max would say, mm-hmm. which I love. Where he's like speaking in her voice. He's like, Jack, I betrayed you. Jack, I, you know, I, this, I lied to Anne. He's like, that's what I thought I was going to hear from you. Mm -hmm. And she's just like, dude, seriously, Spain's here. (laughs) She's just, I just love it. She's, Max is just like, stop already. Everyone just stop and just deal with what's actually happening, please. And then Jack knows that Woods Rogers invited them. Mm hmm. Because he he's the only person who's really seen. Yeah, absolutely. 
Mm-hmm. And who knows what Woods Rogers is capable of. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. So, so right. And then, right. But then he goes, I'm sorry. It's just so hard for me not to just quote Jack. I wish I could just like, I, maybe everyone's seen it. They're all listening to us, which means they've seen how adorable he is. I just love it. Yes. He's just like, change of plans, Spanish invasion. Yep. You're welcome to stay if you like. <laughs> I no, just Jack love him. Jack is perfect. He's so great. Mm-hmm. Jack is perfect. It's so true. And then he he says, "Are you coming to Max?" Which is a great, great line. Yes, I, I won't say it again. And and the look on her face is great too, where she swallows her pride and mm-hmm. follows along. And I almost expected her to touch him somehow, or take mm-hmm. his arm, or something. But it was yeah, it was. Lovely. Oh no. There is no touching between these two. Oh, I know. I know. But it was just... I know. It, it was... I, I suppose what I mean to say is that mm-hmm. there was that obvious not touching. That yeah, obvious absolutely. not looking at each other. And yeah, that's what I mean to say. Yes. Yes. Um. Yeah. I just... Yeah. The tone of these two in this episode mm-hmm. is so perfect. I mean, it yeah. just... It speaks to everything that these two respect each other mm-hmm. and are really mad at each other mm-hmm. and have all of this history and loyalty to each other, yes. which has been broken, mm-hmm. but it's still kind yeah. of there. Yes. And it's all, it's just all there. It's just sitting yeah. there. Like all of that stuff I just said is just like sitting there between their two bodies while they're talking to each other yes. in both scenes. And I love it. Mm-hmm. I love it so much. Um, yeah. It's really intense. Okay. So then also I really fascinated that Featherstone keeps trying to convince Jack to leave and Jack wants to wait. Featherstone is so likable in this episode. He's so lovely. I mean, he's always likable, but he's yeah. just no, extra adorable. I know. He really episode. is. Yeah. He really is. Um, okay. So then we have where Max goes to Anne. Mm, and this is where the performance is just so gorgeous. Uh, I feel choked up. And I don't even care that much about her and Anne. Uh, oh, that's funny. I care so I know much you about do. her and Anne. I know how much you care about her and Anne. But I just, <laughs> I'm like, ah. Also choked up. I'm, I'm fascinated, though. There's so... I, I really would love your opinion on this. So she said, I loved you and I betrayed you. And that's where mm-hmm. I get choked up. And then she says, I will not apologize. Yeah. I did what anyone would do with those impossible choices. And it's interesting. Like, I don't agree with her. I don't think that's what anyone would do. The Mm things she did. It's what anyone would do who was trying to stay within civilization. Yeah. And I guess that's what she means. I think what she might mean is anyone in my position would have done. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But she's. And it's, I mean, it's interesting. Like, I love that she says that, you know, I would be lying to you if I apologized. Mm -hmm. But she's also making an argument that means nothing to Anne. Yeah. Right? It's pretty clear. Yeah. Which is why they had to break up. I mean, that's why Max understood that they had to break up, that they, that they had such different goals and values, kind of, mostly goals, or that Max's goals always were incompatible with with Anne's true mm-hmm. self yes uh-huh. so she's speaking to both of those but like part of me was just I guess like the wish fulfillment part of me who was just like Max you could have just walked away you could have just yeah. gone pirate back then you're doing it now anyway to some uh-huh. extent maybe I don't know I mean I it it is such a relief to me that Max is finally you know this whole season she's been so put upon and like strong in her quiet way, you know, like sure. not giving up Featherstone and Adele. Right, surviving. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, but surviving, but also not surviving at the expense of other people. Yes, sure. I suppose that's what I mean. Yeah, holding her own. Yes. She was holding her own, but she wasn't this person, this Max. Yes. I'm really psyched for this Max. I want, I, yeah. I've been waiting no, for this Max great. to emerge. I know and that again, you have been. Uh-huh. Right. Back to my whole thing about people letting go their thing that from their childhood trauma, like this might be the moment when Max is doing that. I mean, she was forced to because everything's been taken right. from her. Sure. But if she turns her back now on that and just goes with her moral self, which was, has always been there. But sure. she was willing to compromise that self 
for the sake of this larger goal, mm-hmm. I'll be super happy. Again, <laughs> it's not a smart, it's not a smart road, you know, survival wise, but you know, mm-hmm. But again, she has a plan, which I don't really get either. I'm like Jack. I'm like, I don't really understand what no you want to do. I have no idea what this plan is, but we're going to find out. I'm going to assume that you're smarter than me because Max is smarter than everyone. Yeah, she's pretty smart. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, I love that Featherstone recognizes her what she did for him. I love that. I love that there's a goat on that boat. Just got to say. Heard a yes. goat bleeding. Again with the yeah, with yep. the animal noises and jack. Well, yep, well, I noticed that too. Well, no, but also dairy goats. You know, we just we just have a dairy, long yeah, line of goats. dairy goats. We do. <laughs> we do. You're gonna be on a ship. You need a dairy goat. I understand this now. Sometimes yeah. the dairy goat bad things happen to the dairy goat of all right. varieties. Uh-huh. Uh but yes, we'll hope that this dairy goat maybe has a better life than some other dairy goats in the past <laughs> of black sales. Right. <laughs> all right. Let's talk about that scene. Um, I do have one bit of uh, behind the scenes information about the scene with Max and Jack at the end. Okay. That scene was supposed to be up on the decks with people around them. And uh-huh. because of weather, it had to be below decks. Oh. Which turned out to be the best thing, I think. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just like tidbit from Toby Schmitz. Thank you, Toby. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, that weather, weather forced them to be in the set that they ended up being, the below wow. decks. Yeah, that's great. And yeah, and he said that that kind of allowed him to be much stronger in his reaction. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So Max, so smart. Thank you, Max. She's like, seriously, war against civilization? Civilization has been winning that war for 10,000 years against men richer, braver, stronger, and smarter than you. Mm -hmm. Which is just the worst thing to say to Jack Rackham, but also very true. And it does. It gets under, it sticks in his craw. It does. It does. He also, that nod that he gives when she says, you know, are you going to help me or not, or whatever it is? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's good stuff. But see, but what I love about this argument is that they're both right. He says that result. Yeah, that result is because of your betrayal. Yeah, yeah. Well, and she, this is where she mentions the chair too. She says he's right. in my fucking chair. Yep. And oh, she I says you that. cannot fight civilization from the outside in. Right. But she seems to be now. I mean, she's when she rode away from town. Well. We don't know what her plan is. I, I mean, it might be a right. very civil. It- plan is. Right. Mm-hmm. It could be a very civilization based plan. I'm it so fascinated. It right. It could be very subversive. Uh huh. Right. And I love that he said, like, he- they all wanted to kill you. Yeah. And he's- what does he say? He says, bark at me again and I may reconsider. Bark at me again. Yes. I just love it. I love these two. I've always loved these two. That whole thing yeah. about them circling each other. Yeah. The thing about about Jack before Anne was even had had her sights on Max. Like mm-hmm. that Jack said, I don't know which is sexier. Like right. I, you or whatever or your smart self. I don't remember what your he said, but it was like yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But like basically he's like, What what turns me on about you is actually how fucking smart you are. <laughs> right. Yes. Which she certainly is. Yeah. Right. And then she says, If killing me seems the smartest thing to do, then it is clear that none of you have right. any idea how to how to defeat Woods Rogers. Yeah. And he listens to her and because he knows who she is. Grandfather. I just don't I don't understand. We'll just have to see. Yep. I know. I, don't know. I, I don't, cannot I wait to it. see what Max's yep. plan is. Yep. I really, I honestly cannot wait. Mm-hmm. So I have a few points about this. Like, again, okay. I think they're both kind of right. It's very interesting in the early 1700s to say you can't fight civilization from the outside. We're not that many years from the from the American Revolution. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh-huh. That's very true. That's what's beautiful is this whole revolution thing at the same time seems batshit crazy. Mm-hmm. And yet, and it's yet, about to happen. Yeah, exactly. It's about to happen. Yeah, no, you're totally right. Yeah. And so I just, well, I what love that, that tension. It's happening at this tiny little island in the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. As opposed sure. to the entirety of the new world. But yeah. Sure, sure. But still, it's just, it's just so interesting that like, that they've, 
that they've placed this idea of revolution, you know, some number of years, we don't know exactly what sure. year it is, but you know, some number of years before the actual revolution happens in the colonies mm -hmm. and, you know, revolutions a little bit later on in the Caribbean. Yeah. So it's not that crazy, and yet it's totally crazy, and I mean, it's mostly crazy because we know it doesn't work out for the pirates, but we don't know what Max's plan is. Like, Max might actually have a plan. I I she believe in Max. <laughs> so, I, so I love that, too. I love that, again, they've managed in this season to like be like, take us down some road that we never anticipated. Who, mm -hmm. what, the, what is this about? I love it. Um, so there's that that I love. I love, I just, yeah, these two were like finally really, like they've had arguments in the past, but it was always where one of them was animated and the other one was keeping their cool. And this was for real. This was yeah. like all that, all of that stuff that had been sitting between them, this whole episode of all of their history and all of their stuff mm -hmm. finally came out and both of them did it so beautifully. Yeah. And I love that when he says, wait, you know how to defeat Woods Rogers? And she says, yes. You're and goddamn you right I do is what she says. God, that's true. <laughs> that's what she says. Totally true. Yes. Uh-huh. And he does her plan. Yep. And yes, he, he knows does. he knows he who Max is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right. That's it. Jack Jack knows what's what. Yes. He knows you listen to Max. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna keep saying this. Just listen to Max, everyone. <laughs> All right. So our last bit is um is when they arrive at the at the Maroon camp. And you even see like when they're uh, when Flint comes out from talking to Silver. He goes up onto the quarter deck. He goes onto quarter deck. Uh huh. I think I'm still right about that, about what that's called. And um, and you see ships already. You see ships in the distance. Oh, I didn't notice. Wow. Uh huh. And uh, and then they arrive at the camp, and there are all these people there. Yes, there certainly are. Uh huh. And uh. how weird was that to see all of these like all these white people who are not our pirates? Like mm -hmm. not. It just. It's so fascinating. Yeah. And you just, you have no idea what's going on. And then the queen explains. Mm -hmm. She's like, Na when people heard that Nassau fell, yep. they started coming here. It's amazing. That really yep. I'm so excited to see what happens. Oh, it's going to be so good. I was surprised they didn't say anything about um, Maddie, though, then. I was expecting that. Well. I guess we get that next episode. We get that probably next. I mean, really, how could they not talk about that? It's going to have no, to I happen know. next Just episode. Like, yes. I well, because they didn't talk yet. But I, I right. love that right after Max has discounted the idea of revolution, of mm -hmm. hitting civilization from without, we arrive, we arrive at the Maroon camp and see what a strong message the fall mm -hmm. of Nassau actually turned out to be. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That's right. All right. I think I've said everything I need to say about this episode. We can move on to our game. Are you kidding? No. I want to talk about Woods Rogers. Oh, right. We haven't talked about Woods Rogers. My goodness. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> it's because those are on separate pieces of paper. They're not in my book. <laughs> oh, I see. The first thing I wanted to say is that, that did you notice when they first get back to Nassau and he's looking around at just... Carnage. The pillaging and the carnage that's Horrible. happening. Horrible. That the woman that he sees, who is clearly about to be assaulted mm -hmm. and is being assaulted, is wearing a green dress. <gasps> I did not notice that she's wearing a green dress. I think that is why he thinks immediately of Eleanor. I, mm. I, I really liked that choice by the costuming department, actually. Mm. And I love that as soon as his, like, his advisors, his counsel comes out mm -hmm. to meet him, he knows something is wrong because it doesn't matter how frightening things are, how crazy things are. He knows that Eleanor would be with them right. and fearless and fierce and not hiding or cowering. And the fact that she is not there, it doesn't even occur to him that, well, of course, she's in the fort. She's taking cover. She's taking mm -hmm. shelter. He knows she would be there with the council, with his advisors to meet him on that beach and that. Yep moves me quite a lot and when he says jesus christ ah uh, say what you want about woods rogers but 
Did we talk about it in the episode with Alistair? Did he say that he thought that Woods Rogers was going to be the death of Eleanor because he was... He said that he didn't think that Woods Rogers ever actually loved Eleanor, that he was just playing her. Did you oh. say that in our episode? I don't think so. Did he? He said it to me. Anyway, I'm oh. so glad that he was wrong because I always wanted Woods Rogers and Eleanor's love to be true and pure. And I'm so happy that it was, even though it was devastating and heartbreaking. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna call. This. I'm calling you out, Liz Stevens. What? I am okay. calling you out. Go ahead. I agree that Woods Rogers loves Eleanor. Uh-huh. I think he loves her poorly. Well, sure. Okay. Okay. No, sure. He's not doing a super great job of it, but he does love her. I'm just saying that okay. he wasn't just trying to double cross and blackmail her the whole time he used him used oh. her for his own agenda. That's oh what no I'm no saying. okay fine. Fair. I will yes. give you that. I just, I just after you've after you've called out Flint for loving poorly and Jack for loving poorly. Sure. Please, please go on the record for saying that Woods Rogers is also, not. Also, yeah, no. He's it's... he's loving poorly. He loves, but he's loving poorly. Uh, yes, but I yes. Although it also seems to be, it almost seems to be more coincidental than it was with Flint. Flint, oh, I Flint totally with Miranda disagree. was awful. He just ignored her, neglected her, and wait. Do you think there's any way Woods Rogers never heard about the Rosario raids? Like seriously, her mother died in the Rosario raids. Okay. Yeah. No, this is bad. This it's is like he is. This is it's, if okay. there was ever paternalistic it's loving. True. It's true. I wasn't this thinking about it for this episode. This is fucking paternalistic in, loving. No, I am sorry. Right. Yes. No, you're absolutely <laughs> right. In this episode specifically, yes, yes. I just I like agree that he loves her so much. Up to I now. do not. I do not anymore. I take back anything I've ever said about them. I am so mad at him. His wife died because he brought onto her island because of his arrogance about who she should be. He Mm. brought onto her island the thing that killed her mother and now has killed her. And this is, I am so sad for Eleanor. I do not, I am so angry at him. And when he's there cradling her, all I can think is, dude, if anyone ever brought on themselves their own tragedy, you are that person now. Yeah. You created no, that's this. Absolutely. No, of course he did. Of course he did. But not in a way that makes but me I, sympathetic to him. Not 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 in a way that like I have sympathy for Flint when horrible things that's happen. That's so interesting. I wonder I have why. No sy- because she, there is no way she was married to him. She told Miranda this story. There is no way... She did not yeah, tell him this story. Flint does this kind of shit all the time. He didn't do it to Miranda. She was the active person. She was the one who said okay. it. Let's go to Charleston. He supported her. He was okay. ready to defend I her. So. I just... Woods Rogers did the one thing that is the terror of her lifetime. Yes. No, and, and I agree with that. He decided for her that the thing that she did was wrongheaded. And rather than go and talk to his wife, which he could have done, he could have gone to that fort and yeah. talked to his wife about her choices. Mm-hmm. He went to Spain. No, no, I no, I completely agree with you that it's an egregious error and that he's loving her poorly. I'm just saying that. It's on par with how we've seen most people love each other in this show. That's all I'm saying. All right. We're going to have to agree to disagree on okay, that one. I think fine. this is way, way worse. I think that the action itself was not, and the motivation for the action was not necessarily way, way worse, but the consequence was. Oh, see, I think that the action was itself. The way mm-hmm. he talked about it to Miss Hudson last episode. Uh-huh. That he called Eleanor's behavior part of something insidious about Eleanor. Oh, interesting. Sure. Okay. Uh, no, he's a bad, bad man. I mean, he's a bad, bad man. <laughs> but I think that they've done a beautiful job of making him sympathetic, even though he's a bad, bad man. Like for me. Oh, yeah. My heart I agree. breaks for him in this episode, even though he's just villainous. And I also found myself happy that he didn't know she was pregnant. Sure. I don't know. 
If I could go back in time, I would tell him right now. See, I know because you're <laughs> that pissed. But I, I what I still I don't know I don't know why I and I think I'm alone and not alone, but I think I am definitely in the minority in this that I have as much sympathy as I do for him. I'm not saying that they didn't make him sympathetic. Like I understand the tragedy from his perspective when he's holding her. Like yeah, in oh, his well, in his version of the story, this is a horrible tragedy that happened to him. And I understand oh, that. So he, I'm saying, oh, I think he blames himself though. You don't think right. so? Oh no, I think he totally blames himself. Okay. Oh, I do think. I do think at that okay. last moment he's probably blaming himself. Again, he was this is super is hubris. Right. I mean it's his fault, but yes. Right. This was this was super hubris and then Spain yes. I mean he's hubris he, exactly. Uh-huh. Right. He sees, you know, from the first minute when he's talking to the governor, he's like, Wait, that's a pirate ship and he's like, I'm not splitting up my fleet for one pirate ship. That's when Woods Rogers is like, Oh, maybe they're not doing what I want them to do mm -hmm. and then right. And then he gets that more explicitly from Grindal. But um so yeah, no, this was definitely his hubris. It, I'm it's hard for me to imagine he's not blaming himself when he's cradling no, her. It's, I'm certain that he is. He was when he first got to that island and saw that she wasn't with right. his counselors. But and yet, I don't. You know what? I mean, again, this is where I, when we were talking in the beginning, I have very little sympathy for him because he's like, look what he's watching. It's like when he watched Berenger cut off De Groot's ear and he didn't give a shit. He doesn't yeah. give a shit. All these people are dying and being raped and burned and whatever, and he's just like, he's just like, oh, whatever. Where's my wife? But where's my oh, wife? Oh, wait. Yeah. Oh, wait. Shit. My wife's actually in danger. Now I care. Yeah, it's true. That's true. I'm sorry. He's a monster. No, he is. He is. Absolutely. I just think he's a well-crafted character of a monster. In Absolutely. Totally agree with you. Yes. He is well-crafted because he's actually a person who's a monster. Yes. He's not just a yes. monster. No, no. Yes. For sure. That's all I'm saying. He's no Ned Lowe. That's all I'm saying. Right. Right. No, no. He's definitely yeah. not an Ed Lowe. No, he's he's certainly complex. And I un and again, I understand his pain mm -hmm. when he's cradling his care. dead wife. No, no. It's more than I don't care. I want him to feel that pain. I want him to feel the pain. <laughs> so if Woo! he was not okay. if he was not yeah. an interesting character, I wouldn't want him to feel that sure, pain. Sure, sure. But because he's an interesting character, I want him to feel that pain because he was he because he loved her so poorly. Yeah. Okay. There. Okay. Now we've talked about him. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> and now I want and now I want Max to tear him to pieces somehow <laughs> using Eleanor's grandfather. And I don't know what that'll be, but I want it to happen. Yep. I agree with Max, as usual. Okay, so moving on to our game, as you said. Ready to guns! Full compliment. <laughs> All right, Liz, before we get to our game. You know what we've been forgetting to do for the past few episodes? Favorite and parts. I know. Yes. And God, did we need it? How did we not do favorite parts in these episodes that were so difficult? So, Mostly we get to the end and it's super duper late at night. <laughs> I know. And we're tired and we've been drinking. I'm tired. <laughs> yes. Okay. So what was your favorite part, Daphne? Oh, there is no question. My favorite part is that moment when Jack touches his eyebrow. I love oh, that so, so much. I love it so much. Yeah. Uh, my favorite part is actually Silver's Last Stand, that, the, the, the battle mm -hmm. for, uh, that whole combat scene and that whole sequence is just so exciting and suspenseful. I liked it a lot. Yeah, it felt, again, like being at the movies. It was really mm -hmm. great. It really is like being at the movies. Yeah. All right. You ready for our game? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, with our new game of Thesis Statements... In theory, everyone gives us thesis statements, and the two of us have actually agreed on one. This time, we couldn't agree. We each have a thesis statement for the last episode mm -hmm. that we both liked ours. And since we have gone really long, we're not going to hash it out. Yeah. We're going to flip a coin. <laughs> and one of us wins. And all of the people who chose theirs wins, too. Yeah. So, although I did notice that mine came up a lot in the yours did actually come up more often than huh. mine. Well, I'm yes. gonna say that I won. Then I don't care what your coin well, says, but whatever. We could decide that. <laughs> that's an op that's one way to go. I think that's a great option. If more people agree with me, then I win. Fair. Okay. Then we're going with Liz's. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. <laughs> yes. Mine was the one about 
kings and whatever I Israel oh, hands yeah, said. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, uh, was that especially in this time in this place a king? Um, I can find it. I don't know. I, be decisive, etc. Uh, where yeah, worry is not a good look for a king. Right. Not in a kingdom like this where loyalty is in short supply. Right. And Liz's was civilization has many faces. Which is also catchier, so even we remember it without even looking it up. So perhaps that really Totally true. It. There's another reason. Uh-huh. Okay, so we're going to go with that. And Perfect. now, so no flipping of coin. All right, Liz. So we have a few people who chose your thesis statement, which is now our thesis statement. But before that, we have two people that we missed last week. Sorry. Uh-oh. Uh, oh, no. I know. I know. Okay, well, one of them is... <laughs> is Stormy Morley. So Stormy Morley is going to get two ships. Prepare yourself. Two ships for Stormy but before Morley. That, okay. But before that, we need a pirate name for at Lucky Lady, who is, like me, huge fan of Max. So please. Oh, give... Lucky Lady, fan of Max. Okay. Yes. So, so we'll Lucky say... Lady needs a really good pirate name. Oh, okay. I'm right on the spot now. Okay. Lucky Lady, fan of Max. Okay. Lucky. Lucky Penny. Bad Penny. I like Bad Penny. Uh, bad Penny something. What? Uh, bad Penny Pembroke. Oh, I like that. Okay. Next up. So Stormy Morley gets two ships because she got this one right and we skipped her last week. All right. What are her ships that she's got already? Okay. She has the Tempest, the Verona, the Ocracoke, the Hurricane. The Willing Mind and Queen Anne's Revenge. Man. Okay. You need to give that lady two more ships. Two more ships. Holy smokes. So she yep. can have a fucking armada, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, think, I think that's true. I think she's now reached uh, armada stage. Wow. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So then she'll also get, speaking of armadas, I guess the Battle Star. Mm-hmm. And I think someone else already has the Brittle Star. That's okay. I like Battle Star. I was thinking yeah, of somebody else. Yeah, Char- it Charlie. Of... I know. I was going to say, and yeah. the other one's the Galactica. That's okay. Um, yes. The Battle Star. I'm giving it to her anyway, says my Manhattan. Okay. Also, uh, <laughs> something else from Battlestar Galactica. The. Yeah, and the Adama. <laughs> All right. Fabulous. I am not well versed in Battlestar. Not, not well versed in Battlestar Galactica, but I believe you. Okay, mm-hmm. next is. Caliban Kelly. Oh, she has all the Tempest ones. Yep. She has the Vesper, the Miranda, the Prospero, the Ariel. That's what she has. Okay. Well, then let's give her the Alonzo. Excellent. Next, at Ithaca, has the Cutlass and the Rapier. Oh, okay. Uh, The Dirk. All right. Excellent. (laughs) I like it. I've got a little little bit of Outlander crossover going on there. Uh Okay. Next. Oh, I think this is a new pirate. Ooh. Yep. Uh, at Lady Godiva. Okay. Godiva, dark chocolate, dark, mm, also naked and on a horse. Ooh, maybe that's better. Um, and diver, deep, deep, dark. Yeah, deep, dark diver. At Gypsy Book Nerd. Yes. Where are you, my dear? That's Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Has her first has her first ship, which is the Frollo. So she needs yes. a ship. Oh, okay. So we'll go with Why not? We'll give her the Quasimodo. All right. And next is uh Kim at Clower Cottage. Yes, Kim. Oh, she gets all the Texas ones. She gets Texas. Okay. So she has the uh, Lone Star, the Alamo, the Santa Ana, and the Mesquite. Uh, now she gets the Yellow Rose. All right. Uh, next is at Charlie 1877. Chumbucky Chumbucky Charlie, Charlie has the Marlin, the Hammerhead, the Nautilus, and the Brittle Star. Oh, and the Sea Urchin. And I'm going to say she gets a lot of all of the aquatic creatures. Okay. So now we'll give her the, hmm, let's give her the great white. All right. I like it. Yeah. Very, very, very black sales appropriate. Okay. Uh Next. 
Next is uh, Katie Bonner. Oh, good. Yes. At Bunham's. She is now a captain, so you need to give her a ship. Oh, way to go. Cat of Nine Tails gets a ship. Okay. So, Cat of Nine Tails, you're going to get. Let's see. And she's what? A New Englander, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, we'll get her something New England y. The, uh, the Cherry Blossom. All right. Next is at Great Chemistry. Where are you? Jen. Red handed Jen. Jen has. Ooh, she has a bunch of ships also. She has. Good. The Squall, the Amazon yes. Queen, the Minotaur. And the Cerberus. Yeah, she was ended up with like the Greek ones for some reason. Yep. Okay, the Theseus is the next All one. All right. Oh, the Theseus. Mm. Thank you, darling. <laughs> Jen, that's a gift for me as well. Okay, uh-huh. next is Usagi Biker. Yes, Red Tide Rider. Uh, oh, promotion to captain, that is. To captain, so she gets though. A ship. So she get, oh, okay. So her ship is a bike, right? Give her a, yep. what? Uh, a Ducati? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, and next week, what we need to do is after you've listened to this episode, you will have until Thursday to give us the thesis statement for this episode, which is episode six. Six of season four. Mm-hmm. And then we will give out pirate names and prizes and ships you took next week for that that's right (laughs) (laughs) all right i think we're i think we've done good okay well then thanks for listening and until next time from common room radio i am liz stevens and i'm daphne olive Fathoms Deep is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and access to other programs, please visit us at commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as a dollar a month can be made to patreon.com slash commonroomradio. Join the conversation by using the hashtag Fathoms Deep and follow us on Twitter at Black Salescast. We ask that you keep your tweets respectful and positive and please avoid spoilers. If you have more to say, we want to hear it in all its spoiler glory. Email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com with Fathoms Deep in the subject line. Thanks for listening.